Uh, good morning, my name is Jim Lewis. Welcome to CSIS. Uh, this will be a good event. It's a timely topic. Um, I always thought that the Wassenaar arrangement was somewhat obscure, so it's strange to see it uh, exciting so much attention, but uh, it's something we definitely want to talk about. Um, we have a great panel, but I will say we tried to get government agencies and human rights advocates to join the panel as well. And after our fourth turn down, I said, oh, forget it. The guys we have are good enough. So I don't know why the people who think the rule is a good idea are unwilling to come and say that in public. Oh, well, um, but um, I will get more than enough from the group we have here on both the pros and the cons of this. Um, let me introduce them very quickly. I'm just going to say their names and affiliations. Um, we should have bios on their website, on our website at some point, so you can check them out. But they're all experts on this issue. Uh, they're experts on many issues, but they are particularly experts on this one. Um, we have Denise Zhang, who is the Deputy Director here at the Strategic Technology Program at CSIS. Stuart Baker, uh, longtime friend and advocate, former foe in the crypto wars. <laughs> Oddly enough, we're on the same side. Something must be wrong. Um, <laughs> Kristen Goodwin from Microsoft, who's worked on these issues for quite a long time and knows them. Uh, Laura Gallant from FireEye, one of the companies that's doing a lot of work in this field and a, a real expert. Uh, Michael Maney, did I get it right? Good, from Symantec, who actually advises the Commerce Department and knows uh, a fair amount of what they're up to. And then I am going to blow this one, I knew I would blow one name, Musaurus. Yes. Close enough? That's not bad, thank you. Um, Katie Masuris from HackerOne. Yes, a real hacker to come and talk to us about. Uh, <laughs> but you aren't wearing a t-shirt. I'm wearing a Great, so um, with that, let's go ahead and get started and uh, we'll take it off. I think the format will be uh, first, Denise will ask the panel questions and then we'll open it up to the, the audience to hear what uh, you might wanna talk about, so thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, good morning, and thanks for every, to everyone for being here today, especially our panelists who flew in from the West Coast, which I think is actually the majority of them, or at least half. Um, my name is Denise Jung. I'm a senior fellow here at CSIS and deputy director of our strategic technologies program. I'll be moderating. I want to assure you that we're going to have a really lively and interesting discussion this morning, just based on the discussion we had back in the green room. Um, about the BIS proposed rule to restrict the export of intrusion software and network surveillance tools. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to just provide a brief overview of the issue. So about a year and a half ago, uh, 41 member con countries of the Wassenaar arrangement got together and updated the agreement. And uh, they decided to include sort of two new categories of software. Uh, for export control, and they are intrusion software and IP network surveillance systems. I'm going to rely on our panelists to describe what that actually means, how do you uh, define uh, what, what that actually covers. But the Wassenaar arrangement is, is basically an agreement to control the export and proliferation of conventional arms and certain dual-use military technologies. So this is a really interesting um, update because these tools were not traditionally thought of as arms or uh, those types of, of, of systems. So the intended goal of this, of this agreement was to limit the export of surveillance technologies to oppressive regimes that use such technologies to stifle political dissent, freedom of speech, or other activities that may violate human rights. And initially, many of the privacy and uh, human rights groups were supportive of the concept. Um, but the, the agreement language and the subsequent uh, proposed implementation rules that came out in late May uh, from the Department of Commerce have created a lot of consternation for companies, <clears throat> for academia, for NGOs, and individual researchers. Uh, that believe that the definitions are just way too broad and too vague, and the burdensome licensing requirements will uh, have a huge negative impact on legitimate cybersecurity, defensive cybersecurity activities that companies employ to identify software vulnerabilities and patch those vulnerabilities to conduct penetration testing of their own networks, to share information about malicious cyber threats between companies and other entities, and, and a host of other types of activities. 
So the comment period just ended this week uh, on the proposed rule on Monday. Um, I think, you know, BIS got a whole slew of comments, uh, and this is really perfect timing to discuss the issue. So with that, I wanted to, to turn to Stuart, um, former government official and uh, partner at, at Steptoe and Johnson and, and guru, of course, on all things cyber. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us about how the BIS process, the proposed process works. What's covered, what's not covered, um, how does the, the licensing process work? What are the disclosure requirements? And of course, what's the penalty for violating? So that's easy. Yeah. To get a license, uh, and uh, there's also civil uh, fines of hundreds of thousands of dollars, maybe a million in some cases. Uh, uh, so you don't screw around. Uh, uh, there are plenty of criminal prosecutions that have been uh, initiated. Voluntary disclosures are uh, frequent, and they are to the Justice Department uh, if uh, it appears that uh, someone in your organization may have known that the uh, uh, sale was unauthorized. So it's very serious. It was serious because it was a cold, it's a cold war uh, uh, measure uh, uh, that was designed to keep the Soviet bloc from acquiring Western technologies that would improve their military. Uh, there are really two export control regimes. There's the um, arms regulation, the military equipment, which is regulated by the State Department, and dual-use technology, which is regulated by the Commerce Department under the Export Administration Act. This is dual-use technology at a minimum, uh, and therefore regulated by the Commerce Department. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about Wassenaar a a little now and then a little at the end. Wassenaar is the way in which the United States tried to persuade other uh, Western allies to adopt similar restrictions on the sale of technology to the Soviet bloc. Uh, uh, and uh, whereas the U.S. has an uh, export control law, most other countries simply treat the Wassenaar arrangement as binding uh, by virtue of its language uh, and its status as an international agreement. It is a long list of stuff that we will not sell to disfavored countries with <clears throat> without a license. That is to say, every private citizen, private company must go to their government and get a license. And that's pretty much what the understanding is uh, in Wassenaar. <clears throat> Uh, traditionally, when we were worried about the Soviet bloc, uh, uh, the U.S. took very hard stands and wanted to cut off large amounts of uh, uh, technology transfers, uh, and Europeans were more sophisticated and a little more eager for their companies to succeed and were much more flexible about granting licenses. And so there was a constant tension in which the U.S. said, uh, you're not living up to the understanding with respect to Wassenaar uh, to the Europeans. As you will see, uh, that dynamic's a little different in this area, um, uh, but the, the tension continues to exist. That the provision here and the proposed rule that has come out of the Commerce Department as a result of an intense interagency process uh, um, follows the Wassenaar tradition of trying to name the technology uh, and say that stuff uh, is going to be restricted by way of transfers. And uh, it follows a traditional rule of saying, the stuff is controlled, the products are controlled, the software about the product is controlled, and technology concerning the, tech, uh, the, uh, the product is controlled. Technology is going to turn out to be a critical discussion here. It is essentially know-how. Uh, understanding how to design a product uh, is um, what is also controlled under U.S. law, more controversially uh, um, uh, elsewhere. And that included, and, and, and then the final element of the overall structure that is being adopted is deemed exports, which says that you can, con you can actually export technology by talking to somebody inside the United States as long as that person is 
uh, not an American or a Canadian. Uh, it, uh, it is a deemed export, uh, which means that uh, you, can, you can export, we could export stuff right here, right now, uh, uh, in violation of the um, uh, Export Administration Act. Uh, uh, and understanding how broad that term is in connection with uh, products that are covered today is an important part of understanding the rule. So now let me turn to the rule quickly and uh, uh, give you uh, the tools you'll need to understand the remaining speakers. Uh, the, the thing that is controlled are systems that, uh, um, uh, that generate, operate, deliver, or communicate with intrusion software. So if you imagine the controls that you would use to drive intrusion software or create it, that's supposed to be what's controlled. Uh, and the, uh, the regulators thought that that would turn out to be a major limitation on the scope of this rule, some real doubt about whether that, in fact, is going to be true. Technology is controlled, uh, uh, but the crucial question is, what is intrusion software? And here I'm going to ask you to kind of imagine uh, a uh, uh, two two-pronged tests. Um, a, and the, uh, the, two pr the first set of prongs are and prongs. You have to have both of those things. And then within uh, each of those uh, uh, prongs, there are two prongs, which you can have e any one of. So let me uh, give you the highlights and then dive in. It's, Intrusion software is something that is specially designed to either avoid detection by monitoring tools or defeat protective measures. So that's prong one. Either of those things gets you into the definition. If you have the second, which is when you have done those things, you extract or modify data or you modify the standard execution path of a program. So those are, uh, if you're diagramming this, you have to have both of those things, but within those two categories, either one of them will do it. Uh, now, let me go back and just stress what the uh, breadth of that language is. Specially designed to avoid detection by monitoring tools. We don't know what monitoring tools are, but uh, we know what avoid detection means. You, presumably something in your computer is looking for what you're doing and you're trying to make sure that something in your computer does not see that happen. P or defeat protective measures. Again, we don't know what protective measures are exactly. Uh, there's a kind of moral judgment in there that it ought to be protective and warm and loving and maternal. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, exactly what a protective measure is, is again, not really well defined. And then finally, that, that's uh, the first set of uh, requirements. Then the other is, do you, does your program extract or modify data? Or does it modify the standard execution path? And, and the standard execution path, again, there's a kind of moral judgment. The, the right path is what you're deviating from. Uh, but exactly what it means to deviate from the standard path is something that is going to be spelled out by the remainder of our uh, panelists. So why don't I stop there? That is the essential legal framework that uh, <coughs> that was adopted and turned briefly then to, uh, to Wassenaar. Wassenaar adopted this rule in the wake of scandals about Western European principally, but also American companies providing tools that were used by authoritarian governments to deal with uh, uh, Arab Spring in ways that uh, um, uh, bien pensant uh, opinion uh, in the West was not comfortable with. Uh, I, and the uh, goal was to say we should not be providing tools <coughs> to these governments that would allow them to squash human rights inside their country. Uh, that is the goal of this, but as you'll hear, it turns out to be much broader than, uh, uh, than that. And, and one of the questions you might ask is, to the extent that this has a major impact on uh, our ability to do good cybersecurity, does it actually foster human rights abuses rather than prevent them? I think that there's a, a real argument to be made that it does. 
And then finally, the question arises, are we applying these in a multilateral fashion so that it does not disadvantage one country's uh, uh, industry? The U.S. has a very strong cybersecurity industry, but it turns out that uh, many other countries with strong cybersecurity industries uh, are not really governed by Wassenaar. That would include Israel, which has a distant relationship to, uh, uh, to Wassenaar, China, which has none, uh, and Russia, which is part of uh, uh, Wassenaar, but uh, widely believed not to apply the uh, licensing standards in the same fashion that we do. Um, last point uh, in that regard is uh, uh, many of you saw that hacking team was itself hacked, or maybe it was an inside job. Uh, uh, looking through those files, it turns out that uh, uh, even though they were selling to um, very authoritarian governments, uh, uh, they continued to be able to support those products long after Italy had um, accepted this set of restrictions uh, and perhaps granted a global license to engage in sales. What that means, I think, is that um, what the U.S. is doing here is probably going to turn out to be something close to unilateral controls on its industry, uh, which will have pretty significant e economic impact. So I'll stop there. So, Kristen, um, as, as Stuart mentioned, the definition of the two categories of software that are covered, um, intrusion software and IP network or surveillance software, what the BIS have said is that, uh, you know, we're not talking about exploits and malware itself. We're actually talking about command and control frameworks, uh, the delivery vehicle, the delivery mechanism, the tools that you might use to actually find zero days, conduct vulnerability testing. And I, I'm curious to get your perspective from Microsoft, you know, since you guys do a lot of penetration testing of your own software, is there a way to, to, to define that? difference, right, from the uh, the software, the malware and exploits themselves versus the items, the types of software that uh, BIS has, has covered? In part, the challenge is one of context. You know, when, when you look at uh, a piece of malware that comes in, uh, the first thing that we do is reverse engineer it. Well, how would you do that? What are the tools that you would use that would support that? those very underlying uh, elements that we might need would, would fall under uh, this licensing regime. So uh, to be able to even understand what the malware is, what it says, what it does, uh, you'd have to go and get a license for approval just to be able to, to start to break it down. Or if it's something that new you haven't seen and you want to cobble together some new, uh, a new tool or a new capability to, to research it, um, then you'll have to go out and potentially pursue a license for that so that you can analyze the, the malware. So uh, how, do you, how do you define or de describe this category? I, I think the, the, the challenge becomes that these are everyday activities. And so if we're looking for a way to, to articulate what should be regulated and what shouldn't, we really need to be very careful that we are not bringing into the scope the everyday activities that are asked of and required by um, everybody here, all the security companies that are, are looking at not only new malware, but new vulnerabilities, uh, new anomalies and anomalous behavior to try to detect what the threat is and how we can appropriately respond or mitigate. And so th that, that definition is really, a, it's a sliding scale. It, it doesn't have a, 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 an easy, uh, an easy uh, um, set of words we can associate with it, but it, it comes back to, I, I think, one of behavior, which is if it's consistent and repeat, repeatedly used as a technique by the security community to address an issue, it, it, it does not uh, and should not have that um, licensed obligation from a security perspective. So, Michael, I believe you are on the uh, Department of Commerce Technical Advisory Committee that actually reviews some of these things of them, prior yeah. to uh, you know them sort of coming to an agreement and, and putting out a rule. And you know one of the primary criticisms of this of of the BIS rule is that that it just doesn't understand the technology and it doesn't understand what industry is doing in this space. And so I was wondering if you could explain sort of the technical consultation process and how it may or may have not worked in this case. Yeah. Well, um, I think to 
uh, Commerce and BIS's credit, they have a very robust consultation process in, in most cases. Um, they have a whole series of technical advisory committees. The one that I sit on is the Information Systems Technical Advisory Committee, which would seem like that would be, you know, sort of right in the sweet spot of what that, that com committee advises on. Um, in this particular case, the um, there's a general conception within, I think, the, um, the various agencies that they understand IT and, uh, and high tech. Um, they have a pretty good, I think, grasp of uh, hardware sys and systems and, um, and probably reasonably good grasp of like big operating systems like Apple's or, um, or Microsoft's. This particular um, area of IT, I don't think they have a good understanding of at all. And um, that, because they thought they understood it, but didn't really, led them down a path that allowed them to think they were um, getting um, the right type of control or put, putting some language in there that would, would get them what they wanted, but without an understanding that what they've actually done is they swept up all the legitimate work that goes on in this space, essentially the entire defense side of this defense offense um, war that's going on constantly around the world. So th there are a couple of different you know, um, ways that that happened. The cybersecurity community wasn't well represented on the tax at the time that this was going through. Um, the reach out or the outreach, I don't think was, uh, was done particularly effectively in this case across the different agencies. I'm not gonna cert certainly single out <laughs> commerce at this point, but the, um, you know, you can come to Symantec and say, this is what we're thinking we wanna do, or this is the, the papers that are coming through from Vossenar on what other countries wanna do, because this rule actually was introduced by the UK through, through their process. We didn't have that, we didn't have that interaction. We didn't have that exchange of information. And I'm pretty confident I could say that the other folks on the panel didn't have that interaction at all. Now, we don't know why that was. Um, there may have been cases where they weren't interested in getting our input, can't say that for sure, but um, it didn't happen. So they went into Vossenar, they rolled into Vossenar, and they thought they had it figured out, I think. They thought they had the space well understood and um, they wrote up the rule. And I think all the other countries, the other 40 countries at Boston Art thought they had it pretty well understood as well. And, um, and somehow they didn't understand that what they were writing actually you know, has a great impact on the legitimate work that goes on around the world and it doesn't really impact anybody at all that they, as Stuart said, were targeting for this control. And, um, and so they passed the rule. Now, now it's a unanimous process. All 41 nations have to say yes to this, which makes it really hard now to go back and say, uh, we made a mistake, because you gotta convince the 41 countries they made a mistake. Well, we, in our meetings that we've had, several meetings that we've had with some of the agencies, you know, BIS and state and DOD, NSA, um, there is significant disagreement, I think, among those agencies about what they're trying to do here. And so the idea that you can also convince the other 40 nations that this was a bad idea is a daunting task. And, and we heard yesterday that they don't want to do it. They're really very resistive to going back and saying, we, we missed the mark on this one. But I, I, you know, I think I read somewhere that a number of European Union countries have actually moved forward and implemented the agreement, and the computer security research community actually prefers some of those other regimes over what we've seen in the United States, the proposed rule here. So what, what are the key differences between maybe the UK model versus what we see here? And anyone should feel free to answer. Well, I think that, as Stuart mentioned, every country has the ability to implement Vossenar in a fashion, form or fashion, that is what they want in their country. A lot of countries don't, you know, actually put it into law or put it into a regulation. Um, a lot of countries, I can say almost every country, with possible exception of the UK, does not have an export control regime like the United States. It's not as robust. It does not as control as many items. and um, 
And indeed, again, as Stuart mentioned, they actually encourage and want people to export to, um, to grow their businesses, to grow their economies. It's, it's, it's an economic incentive for them to let stuff you know, move around without too many restrictions. The other aspect of this is that their export control enforcement is not the same model as we have in the U.S. They're, most countries do not have a um, Office of Export Enforcement, OEE. And so they don't really know very much about what their businesses and their industry are doing or where they're sending stuff around the world unless someone comes in and tells them or that company realizes that they overstepped a boundary and they'll come in and voluntarily disclose that they've, they've made a mistake. And the interesting thing in the United States is that there's a, an investigative process, there's a review. Um, sometimes, as, as, as we said, you'll get fines if, we find, if they find out that someone actually knew about her or, or might have been trying to hide the fact. There could be criminal um, prosecution. In most other countries, um, there will be a what happened in a written, in a written form. But what are you doing to fix it so that it doesn't happen again? Okay, that sounds good. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. And, um, and that's the end of it. So we're not seeing, you know, as, as Stuart said, you know, they're, they're not seeing the enforcement and, that, and the, um, the level of care and, and sweep that the United States is intending for this rule. And so um, you can get teams uh, or companies like, you know, the hacking team being able to get a license in Italy and go right on doing what they're doing. I did. So I think a uh, summary, really, of the difference, uh, the differences is the, the style of enforcement in the United States is very different. There's a default deny uh, in the United States for these license applications, so there's, there's that barrier. Um, and there's also the, the removal of some of the exclusions and protected categories that we saw in the other countries' implementations of the Wassenaar arrangement. So those two together um, form the basis for, for the reason why so many people are up in arms about the proposed United States implementation of the Wassenaar Arrangement, whereas, uh, you know, while the Wassenaar Arrangement additions of uh, intrusion software were disturbing, um, you know, to, to say the least, elsewhere it's not as grave and serious of an issue in terms of its ability to impede the level of defense that the entire Internet needs. And, and in fact, defense itself is more greatly impacted by the controls on offensive technology than offense is. So, Laura, I was wondering, you know, as, as a cybersecurity, computer security provider, and, and Michael, you should feel free to chime in as well here, um, what is the burden on you guys in terms of actually acquiring the license? What's the process that you'd have to go through to acquire the license so that you can continue to provide the services and products that you already provide. Right, right. Well, let me unpack a little bit this concept that we keep discussing, which is this will have an effect on the defensive community. Um, my company is one of the, and Semantic as well, is in, uh, some of the providers of cybersecurity products that help prevent and understand and detect activity that might be malicious that's trying to go into someone's system. So let me give you an example. Malware software that has functionality that we've seen behave in a way that tried to get at information, data, access in someone's network would be blocked in a sandbox, so it'll be detonated before it comes into the network. That's what our product is, right? So if that malware and our understanding of it and the license that it goes out to our cloud where you understand it is regulated under export control, that means anyone who's buying our product who's not a U.S. citizen or using it as a non-U.S. citizen, so think your IT guy who might not be a U.S. citizen at a company in the U.S., won't be able to see that detection activity that's coming in through our product. <coughs> now let me take it one step further. The way that this is positioned and how Stuart laid, laid out the intrusion software definition in the current rule makes something like a system administrator tool that's helping reset the network into the same category that we would call a rootkit that's presumptively denied in this. So we're sitting here talking about products uh, that have a defensive or just a simple IT administrator quality to them that are structurally the same as the presumptively denied uh, rootkits or penetration testing software that would be used for zero-day exploits, 
all falls into this overly broad category that we're talking about as intrusion software. So to get to answer your direct question, Denise, this means that we're talking about thousands, tens of thousands of export license applications that we would be submitting every time I want the researcher in Singapore to help understand what the unpublished vulnerability, the zero day, might be that's trying to hit our client in Japan. But because there's a presumption of denial on zero days, we won't even don't, get the license. Don't bother submitting the application because <laughs> right. it's going to get turned down. So at Symantec, you know, let's you know, we go even a step farther than that. So what Laura is saying is is you know right in Symantec's park as well, and we actually move beyond that to um, what we call penetration testing. So penetration testing is essentially at a very high level trying to hack into your own systems or hack into your client systems to discover vulnerabilities that you know, were not known. Well, that's the definition of a zero day. Most of the work that we're doing involves something that we have now been told is going to presume to be denied if we want to work in that space. We penetration test all of our products to make sure that they're safe and secure. And we do that by basically adopting the same um, tools and tactics and techniques, processes and procedures that the bad guys might use that want to come in for, a malicio for malicious purposes. Then we also penetration test our networks. And because we're a multinational company and every company here and a lot of companies out there, most of the companies out there are all multinational, their networks are going around the world in real time at the speed of light. And so by definition, when you're in your network, you're going to be crossing a boundary, which makes it an export. And so you're, you're going to get swept up in this. And so the, um, the work goes on, and it is done in a way that is very safe and secure. It's actually like the most secure environment that we can create in, in the IT world, because these vulnerabilities and exploits that we're working with and discovering are so extraordinarily dangerous. And if they got out, they could, you know, they would bankrupt us. They could bankrupt our clients' um, uh, companies as well. And so we operate in a very controlled, very rigorous process because we're, um, you know, hugely incented to make sure we we keep this stuff safe and it and it doesn't go where it's not supposed to. And then we basically, you know, beat up our systems and we beat them to a pulp. And we try to find um, where the vulnerabilities are, and we always find them. Everybody's system has some vulnerabilities, whether you know it or not. And so because we find all that information and we write it up in a report, we share it with our labs around the world. We have like nine labs around the world. We have you know, 50,000 employees scattered all over the world working on this stuff. It goes to all those people, especially when you've identified a, a vulnerability or an exploit. And we have an expert, for example, in India who is an expert in this vulnerability or this exploit. It goes to him so that he can research as quickly, effectively, and efficiently as possible the um, remediation for that and, and develop a patch and get the patch out uh, as quickly as possible. Could, could All I that work would be um, significantly impact, uh, impacted to almost to the point where it might come to a screeching halt. Now, what does that mean? Let me just go one step further, Denise. That means that every company who has networks that rely on penetration testing to ensure that they're safe is impacted by this rule. We can't deliver to you a penetration test without waiting maybe up to six months to get a license. So that puts your network at risk. And all the third parties, the hundreds of companies out there, third party companies that do this work will also be um, caught up in this and wouldn't be able to provide those tests. That actually makes um, the critical infrastructure of the U.S., and I would say even the critical infrastructure around the world at higher risk of getting penetrated and getting hacked. And that is exactly the opposite of what they wanted to achieve with this rule. They've gone in the, they've gone, they've inadvertently gone in the other direction. And it, it hits at every phase of the cybersecurity cycle. Detection, prevention, response, and recovery. You know, we have employees in 128 countries, and uh, I have never seen a cybersecurity thread, an, a conversation about a threat or a vulnerability that hasn't involved someone from outside the United States or Canada. I mean, it, it just doesn't happen. I've been the lead attorney for the Microsoft Security Response Center since 2008, 
it is a global team. It is a global process. Every time there's a vulnerability, we work in a follow the sun type of a capability. So we're moving around the world. And so when you look at, uh, I come back to the, to the everyday use point. Every tactic and technique that's being talked about here, these are everyday use processes for us. And so to have to go on a per email basis to the Department of Commerce and ask for the, the permission to move to the next step or to share the next piece of data, share the next tool, build the next uh, um, uh, uh, piece of, of code to, to move forward in the analysis, that's just not a workable process. It's not workable for, for commerce. It's not workable for the private sector. It's not workable if, in the event that other countries were to impose that sort of regime on us. So uh, we, we simply have to have something for every security researcher from the smallest individual finder all the way up to the big companies like us that is scalable, that is narrowly tailored, and that is focused on things that are not in the category of everyday use. Maybe Katie and then Michael and Stuart. Well, you know, we heard, we heard some proposals for addressing this issue, which is sharing information within one organization that has multinational employees um, that from outside the United States and Canada, and that's something called an intra-company uh, transfer license. That will not help considering this is a global community of defenders that spans multiple organizations. So even the proposed uh, remedies to some of the problems that you've been hearing are still not adequate. And if you, if you take it all to its logical conclusion of all of the carve-outs that would be needed to you know, essentially remove the impediments to defense, what you have left is you're, you're not actually going to be regulating anything at that point. So, I mean, taking a step back and looking at, um, you know, I've known Kristen for many years. Before, before I worked at HackerOne, I was a security strategist at Microsoft. And one of the things that, that I created there was Microsoft's bug bounty programs. And specifically, there was a program that is still running today called the Mitigation Bypass Bounty. And what that is, it's specifically soliciting for the information that is described in this rule. And Microsoft pays hundred up to $100,000 for information on new exploitation techniques. So these are things that can bypass all of the protective countermeasures as defined in this rule. And the language is almost identical um, in the description of that bounty program. The reason why that bounty program exists is because the only other way that a company like Microsoft could learn about new exploitation techniques was through actual attacks. So providing a defensive incentive to bring those forward earlier gives companies like Microsoft a head start in defense. Now, that program was launched just a few months before the Wassenaar arrangement added these rules. Kristen, would you have let me go forward with that program if, uh, if, if this rule had been in place? I, I can hear you say get to yes, Katie, but mm. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think it would have happened. Now, that program has awarded that bounty at least five times in the last two years. Five times that Microsoft gained access to the technology that is regulated in this proposal. And that would have been five times that Microsoft would have not had access to that information to build a more secure operating system for the world. So this is a concrete example of how this regulation impacts defense. Well, and so taking on from what Kitty was saying, and company like, you know, Symantec or all the companies here, um, goes through a, 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 a rigorous process to understand the technologies and products that we're, we're producing and, and working with so that we can make a determination on whether or not we, we need a license. And at Symantec, for some of our more complicated technologies or products, that can take up to several months to go through the back and forth with the engineering guys. So if you're talking to some guy you know, down in the basement in Mountain View about his technology, it's a process to try to get him to you know, explain to you in English what it is that he's working on and be able to take that and put it into a license application. Under this you know, proposed regime that, that is, is, is out there, we're scratching our heads, frankly, because we don't even know if we would know how to write a license application for this type of, of work or these types of products because, as Getty mentioned and, and everyone else, 
this stuff happens and is worked on and is changing so quickly in a matter of hours, sometimes minutes, that I'm writing a license application for a piece of technology that we want to work on. And within, you know, in the morning and in the afternoon, they're, they're on a different track and they're working on a different piece of that um, or an adjunct to that that would, um, would, would change the license application. So I can't, I can't even imagine a scenario where I could put a license, license application in, have BIS review it and say yes or no in a fashion that would allow you know, my guys to continue working on uh, the, the, the projects that they have going forward. So um, I want to go back to penetration testing because I think it, it reveals the, the core flaw of this proposal. Penetration testing is basically taking the tools the bad guys already have uh, and using them against somebody who's paying you to do that to see if they can withstand an attack from the bad guys. That's it's as simple as that. Uh, no one thinks that we should be controlling those kinds of testing. That's, that's silly. That's, that, that's how you get a more secure system. So, uh, but because what we're controlling under the law is the tool, then every use of that tool has to be licensed. So you're, you're creating a massive structure for licensing uh, activity that we want to occur. That's a little crazy. Because of the technology rules that say talking about it, know-how about it, if you talk about what's new in the tool uh, that the bad guys are using, you're also conveying, uh, you're exporting that t technology, and so every foreigner you talk to about that is a licensable event. Uh, and again, uh, crazy in this context. It's also the case that we're not gonna stop the bad guys from having these tools. They already have the tools. We're taking their tools and using them to test whether we can withstand their attacks. No export control regime is going to have any impact on the bad guys. There's a narrow little edge case, which is if you took those tools and gave them to a government and the government used it against their people, they could be using it in a way that we consider inappropriate. Fine. That is a tiny sliver of the activity in this area, but in order to get at that sliver, we've created this list that says everything is regulated, everybody comes in for a license. Now, how did we get there? I, I, uh, I heard Jim Lewis talk about to the fact that we were in what I'm afraid we have to call crypto World War I now, uh, now that we're in crypto World War II. Um, a, and I suspect, because a lot of this was um, a, a bumper sticker introduced by the ACLU and perhaps some other human rights groups saying these, this malware should be treated like a weapon and regulated as such. And we should go to Wassenaar and we should regulate the malware. Uh, and I, I, I've all, long thought that, that that was really a kind of uh, echo of the crypto wars, that they were on the other side of the crypto wars, they saw encryption being treated as a weapon, regulated, licensed, subject to Wassenaar, and they said, well, that's wrong, but boy, it's powerful. And now they have said, now that we're in control, we want to use all that power to get at this, this, this activity that we don't like, which is certain governments misusing the technology. Uh, I think they fundamentally misunderstood uh, the power of international regulation. And of course, the crypto wars ended with the guys who thought crypto should be regulated like a weapon losing uh, for very good economic reasons that apply across the board to this. Uh, and so the whole idea of saying we should use export control regulations to reach this kind of activity uh, by designating the thing as a regulated thing is, is misconceived in a way that's very hard to fix with little license exceptions, which is what the, uh, the government is now struggling toward. I think we've pointed out a number of ways in which the regime is flawed, but I thought I would add another one or and solicit some comments from, from the panelists. So I'm curious to um, understand sort of how Congress thinks or is reacting to the, the proposed rule because, um, you know, as we've seen in the past couple of years, there's been an effort to pass legislation 
that would improve cyber threat information sharing. And under the proposed rule, it's not just the software that's covered, but any type of data that can include email, communications, about tactics, techniques, procedures that are being used to conduct vulnerability testing, identify zero days, et cetera, et cetera. That's the, that includes the types of information sharing that we're trying to promote with legislation. So it seems to me that there is definitely um, a rub, a contradiction there. And I'm wondering if anyone has talked to folks on the Hill about this, or what's their perspective? Surely some of them are also concerned about the human rights abuses, as well as just the sale and transfer of exploits, malware, malicious code. So what do folks hear on that side? One of the things that I think is, is interesting about you know, um, the human rights and privacy advocacy groups um, that are out there, thinking that, you know, um, cybersecurity is sort of bad because of the penetration testing and intrusion software, and that it's, you know, it's a weapon and, and we should regulate it, as, as Stuart mentioned. And it's exactly the opposite. It's, you know, the cybersecurity industry is actually, you know, their, mo their, their most powerful ally in protecting people's privacy and ensuring that, you know, um, you know, bad things don't happen to people in, 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 in the human rights arena. And so as we're talking to, you know, and doing outreach to the various agencies and, and Congress, we're pointing out that there's no, there's no um, us versus them here. It's, it's all us on, on this issue. And to the extent that this rule goes forward as is, and you've crippled your cybersecurity industry, you've now, um, You've, you've raised the, the bar significantly in terms of risk for privacy and, and, and human rights. And so the, um, that, that gets their attention and, and that gets their interest. Now we've gone up and we've spent, you know, probably you know, a couple of weeks, we've done many, meeting, many meetings with various um, committees and staffers. And what we typically find is that some of them may have heard of Vassenar, but have no idea really what it is. Um, and so we're seeing this, this really interesting, this interesting problem that we have, which is no one really understands cybersecurity and what the cybersecurity business does, other than to say, ooh, it's, it's scary and it's, and it's bad. And then we also have export control um, regimes and understanding how export controls work and how Vosner works. Two very arcane and, and very sort of like murky areas that that uh, no one really gets. And so we have to spend a lot of time trying to say, here's what's going on, here's what all this means, and here's, and here's context for you about this. And once we do that, they, you know, the interest perks up significantly, and they um, are really trying to, um, I think, find ways that they can join in this conversation and this dialogue. And, um, and I think one of the things we've seen consistently across the, um, the area of, of congressional outreach is that, you know, this whole sharing of cybersecurity information and research, it's, it, you know, the president has issued an executive order, I think it's 13691, that says we need to enhance and do everything we can to enable and facilitate security, you know, sharing or, uh, and research in the cybersecurity realm. There is legislation that's being called for, um, significant legislation being called for, to do enhancements to cybersecurity and, um, and sharing and research. And so it's, it's, it's though sort of the one hand doesn't know how, what the other hand is doing here in, in some respects. And it does definitely contradict you know the idea that we want to regulate and restrict this type of activity uh, I think Senator Warner has already asked the, the uh, Commerce Department to ensure that there will be a second set of um, comments uh, uh, from uh, you know after after the uh, first set of comments is uh, absorbed and a new reg written uh, he would like to see that put out for comment uh, um, so, uh, you know, my, my sense on this, and, and uh, I've worked with uh, a coalition that includes several people uh, who are up, uh, on the panel, uh, is that uh, it's not that hard to sell uh, uh, in Congress. They say, wait a minute, so this is going to hurt U.S. industry, might hurt cybersecurity generally by, by restricting what we can do. 
doesn't have anything to do with national security uh, and uh, probably won't actually achieve the human rights goals that are uh, proposed, uh, uh, but it will allow the State Department to exercise its moral vanity around the world. Uh, and that's why we're doing it? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not buying it. The, you know, it's been brought up how this hurts defense as a whole, um, and and specifically also hurts uh, hurts U.S. companies who provide defenses. There's also a company like mine, which is part of this brand new defensive incentive economy. As as you know, hackers can make money by selling zero days and exploits on various markets, and they can be selling them to be used for offensive purposes. And you know the program that that uh, you know various bug bounty programs and uh, programs like Microsoft's mitigation bypass bounty represent a growing, but yet still small defense incentive economy for this type of dual use information. And so a company like mine, which is the very first platform provider for vulnerability defense and bug bounties, we have only just begun. Our first bug was filed on our platform 20 months ago. Since then, over 10,000 different bugs were closed. If this you know, were to go forward, this will have a serious effect on this growing defensive incentive economy of which my company is one of the players. If you look at culturally how the cybersecurity industry works. It's at a really interesting juxtaposition against legislation. Legislation is trying to force information sharing. It's trying to create a schema that incents companies to share information with the government. Uh, this proposal would be uh, further adding regulation and process to sharing information even within the industry. Now, we'll look at that against what cybersecurity personnel typically use to govern the exchange of information called the traffic light protocol. If any of you have heard of it, it's really simple. It's red, don't share with anybody but the person you give it to. Yellow, share with those that you feel are, are trusted. Green, keep within your environment. And then white, it's public information. It's not a written NDA. It's not a liability exemption approval. It's, a, it's an entire global network, even with a, a taxonomy that DHS publishes, that's based on trust. I mean, these are companies, individuals, finders, academics, all around the world in a global environment that operate on a self-imposed, self-regulated system of trust. And so that's the very special and unique nature of, of what happens in cybersecurity. So if we upend this through a legislative or an, an onerous regulatory approach that requires each step of this path to, to, to have to obtain a license or to see if it can backbend into a position of, a, of an exception that, that decimates this very culture that we have, which is enabling global, and I mean global, responders to be able to, to operate. And so it's just, keep that in mind. You know, the security community is governed by a set of trust principles, and it is not a regulatory-based environment. So we're, we're going to have to, to, to continue to think about, if we, if we go forward with this, are we really stifling the, the ways in which the, the cybersecurity industry works, full stop? So at this point, I think we'll turn to questions from the audience um, in the corner. Could you please wait for the microphone and also introduce yourself? Michael Schrager with MIT. This is a very interesting conversation, but the one thing that you've left out, and I want to make sure that I understand this because sadly I'm old enough to remember COCOM when Richard Pearl was running it. Um, the, the issue is, what about your customers? If I am Goldman Sachs, if I'm a SIFI, I'm completely network dependent and cyber confident. I've, it used to be that I hired a CISO to deal with this issue, but now I've got the cyber risk committee of the board with fiduciary responsibilities and liabilities to go along with that. You're telling me that if I'm running a SIFI, I literally cannot be a fiduciary because I cannot, by every single comment that's been made here, guarantee or provide assurance as to the cyber protections of my global network. Is, is my understanding of this correct, based on what you're saying, that your customers are screwed? I mean, with all due respect to Semantic and FireEye, <laughs> it's your customers who aren't able to update 
as a function of your products and services. Is that, is, this a legitimate, is that a fair understanding? Yeah, I think so. I mean, look, I have managed service clients all over the world, right? Our fire is a service client. I can't share with them that this is malware that's trying to hit their network, right? And could that be their branch in you know, Taiwan that's trying to get hit and it's actually a US company? I can't even share it with their security operations center in Taiwan. You can't share it within your company without yeah. coming and get licenses. So your IT guys running your worldwide network would need to be able to, or would have to come in and get licenses to be able to take whatever report Symantec or FireEye gave you and try to mitigate those vulnerabilities. Well, I just have one, one obvious follow-up. And the Fed doesn't know about this because the Fed is responsible for clearing transactions and the New York Fed is ostensibly responsible for cyber integrity. I can't. I can't speak. Treasury. Treasury has not been involved in our inter, in any of the interagency meetings that I've been in, to my knowledge. DoD has been involved, but DoD through their their technology directorates and, and the NSA have have um, have chimed in and um, been less than than supportive of 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 industry in, in these areas. And so, one of the things we put in our comments that was really important to try to get out was exactly your point. It's not it's the critical infrastructure in the U.S. and all over the world, including research and the infrastructure and academia that that you're representing. All this gets impacted by it because there, you all either have by by. Um, law as a fiduciary um, responsibility or by industry standards a requirement to ensure that your networking is safe and secure and you're going to do that by you know your own IT departments by using third parties by using Symantec or using FireEye to come in and do that type of work for you we would have to say uh, your network moves outside the US and Canada yes okay well we'll have to come back to you in six months after we have our licenses in place so so uh, I, uh, when I was at DHS to, to, to get into the interagency politics of this uh, uh, we had an interest in certain export control decisions because we felt there were technologies that had to succeed commercially and therefore had to be easily licensed uh, um, that general policy applies, still applies, but uh, the State Department in particular has been enormously resistant to having DHS participate in this. DHS has uh, finally crashed the party, uh, and they have a strong interest in the cybersecurity of all the industries that they deal with. I think you're quite right. The, tre the Treasury probably still doesn't know that this is going on, uh, uh, but they're, they're going to hear soon. <laughs> we have a question in the front here. I'm Terry Murphy. I, uh, I've learned a lot today. I thought I knew something about this area. I've been out of date, but it still it was uh, very enlightening. Uh, but also, I'd just like to comment. I served for four years on the RAPTAC, Regulation and Procedures Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, Stewart, by the way, did not uh, fully disclose. He was general counsel to NSA. And if he told you a tenth of what he knows, he would have to kill you. <laughs> so, so he's tremendously involved in this. Um, I'd like to comment quickly on something that Michael said that was quite disturbing to me. When I joined RAPTAC, and I think it was quite normal, I had a, uh, we had s secret security clearances. The conference, the meetings were half public and half private. To get a security clearance, you had to fill out a form this big. I had top secret in the Navy. I don't remember anything like that. But, and I had to list all my contacts in all the embassies I'd ever heard of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll but be getting it, a letter from OPM shortly. Well, that's, that's okay. We have but already. the process of the getting that clearance turned us, literally turned us, from lobbyists vis-a-vis -vis the government to collaborators with the government. With the government. We were there to provide industry. I'm a lawyer, but we were with many client contacts over the years. Uh, we were there to provide the industry perspective to the government, but also be part of the government process. And I didn't hear that from Michael. I heard that the government, uh, that I'm out of date, mm -hmm. uh, that the government has gone away from you. Uh, and I have to tell you, when we worked on regs, we didn't just go to the meetings. I couldn't tell you the number of emails that would circulate on the woulds instead of shoulds instead of everything. 
So I, if, if Senator Warner is, if Stewart is, is correct about what might happen, if you get another chance, then I strongly urge, uh, you may not be on that anymore, Michael, but I strongly urge anybody who's on these advisory committees to act like the government. That's your job. You're not just as industry. Don't sit there and wait and say, well, they're governing us. Do so you have a question be, be as well for the panelists? <laughs> just, <laughs> okay. I, I could respond to sure. the comment. Um, that was taking up too much time, I hope. Um, so I glossed over the process a lot because of, you know, just trying to get, get it out there. But essentially, your descriptions are, are pretty close to the way the process still works today. I have a secret clearance. I used to have a top secret clearance. Um, we were told on the ISTAC that even though we're coming from industry, we're not there representing our company. We're there as technical experts to the government to advise them. And they did engage rather late in the game, I think, in, 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 in some cases, when, when the rule is about to be published as it is. And all that back and forth and exchange that you talked about went on with the, with the ISTAC. But I can say, and I, can, I, and I think that you know, in our meeting yesterday with, with the various agencies, there is a, I think they're completely wrapped around the axle on their interagency process on this rule. They can't agree on what the rule should say in a lot of ways. And, and I think I'm being fair in saying this, that you know, the, um, the technical experts aren't helping them. Whoever they're talking to aren't really helping them. And, and so there are people that are wedded to this thing for emotional and, and sort of, you know, um, we're doing the right thing type of, type of reasons without any real knowledge about what it is that, that they're trying to regulate. So we, can, we feed into that. But it's, it's, not, it's, it's not moving the works. It's all, it's all gummed up. So they publish a very broad rule that sweeps in everything. And then they told us yesterday, we expect industry to come back to tell us you know, where we want carve-outs, exceptions, and exemptions to this rule. And to me, that suggests a couple of things. One, and happy to hear from folks in, in the audience. One, you don't really know what it is you're regulating, do you? You don't understand what it is that you're regulating or what it is you're trying to get after here in a way that is effective, uh, that actually would achieve your goal, but also preserve a, a critical industry in the United States. And second, your you know, really smart technical people aren't helping you and don't really understand it either. And so they have to come back and say, industry help us out here you know, and, 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 and put all these carve outs in place. And by the end of the day, it's going to be very interesting to see what is left that is being regulated after we have put all these carve-outs in there. Do they even have anything worth putting on the books at that point? But there's a couple you know, steps we need to take in, to, to make sure that that happens. We have to see the U.S. industry invited in to participate in the U.S. delegation. We have to see U.S. industry being able to engage in the plenary sessions. Uh, there's a technical advisory committee meeting coming up. I, I, you guys know better than I. I think it's in September. But mm -hmm. having the private sector have a place at the table to be able to talk about these issues and, and get those discussions moving in a, in a more open and deliberate way. You know, I, I think one of the things that is being communicated very clearly to state defense and commerce is that the security community wants to engage. We want to be participants in this dialogue. We all agree human rights and the, the use of surveillance technology to, to, to abuse that is, is uh, absolutely uh, not the right behavior. And we, we want to be able to engage on how to make sure that we are doing the right thing and not harming the security of the world's customers writ large because we're, we are overbroad and uh, not necessarily as focused as we should be. So U.S. industry and the delegation start uh, getting ready for plenary and start that dialogue with the technical advisory committee as quickly as we can. So there was, there was a mood yesterday when we were speaking to these uh, different agencies that uh, some of them were very, you know, as you pointed out, kind of emotionally attached to, uh, to the implementation that was as written. And it reminded me of when I used to be a penetration tester showing a company that their software had bugs and they did not want to accept that, that in fact there were flaws. And so I feel like we are, we are at this point where the industry here is trying to point out some bugs in this, in this Wassenaar arrangement and the implementation. And ideally, 
we will have a better reception um, at doing this, pointing out these flaws and being able to remediate them. Um, but I saw some very interesting parallels between, between doing that technical work and having to do this technical advisement of these regulations. We had a question in the back row there. Hi, Carrie Ann from the Organization of American States. Um, my question is twofold. Um, the rule that is being proposed would affect governments and especially the, you, most governments do have their services being provided in the US. And it would affect as well law enforcement officers where many governments do have in their cybercrime legislation the ability for law enforcement to develop internally intrusion detection software to be able to investigate certain cybercrimes. So my question is, has industry done an impact assessment as to how that would affect your clients, especially government clients, to be able to present to the regulators as to how this would affect globally, not just your private sector entities, but your government entities, including law enforcement? So, um, and Stuart, you can jump in here as well. There is a, a government exemption in the rule. So if we were gonna work with the US government, theoretically, you know, we would be exempt from, from licensing requirements. The potential exists in the way that we're reading it, and we're, um, for a good reason, reading it very conservatively. That wouldn't necessarily apply if I wanted to work with uh, foreign governments on penetration testing. So if I wanted to um, work with Brazil, or if I wanted to work with um, the UK even, um, I might need you know, to get, enter into this licensing, this licensing process to, to work in that. So then you go also to the, um, the public and private interactions with law enforcement organizations around the world, because law enforcement, you know, is, is also a leader in this area of trying to, to stop this proliferation of, of, of hacking um, going to the wrong people and, and to the rogue nations. So we would potentially, potentially, if I read the rule, um, in a way that it, um, um, it seems to be written, uh, we would need licenses then to also go and work with those, those international law enforcement um, organizations. And we would have to tell them, I can't give you the latest tools right now because I'm waiting for my license. You know, it seems to me that um, uh, law enforcement has a lot of roles here, uh, and certainly prosecuting hackers is one of them, but uh, law enforcement also Faced with strong encryption, TLS uh, spreading around the world, uh, uh, is having to hack uh, their criminal systems in order to, to, to gather evidence. Uh, um, I think that is almost in the bullseye of what the State Department intends to regulate, and they intend to say, I'm sorry, we don't have a very good relationship with Ecuador this year. Uh, and we don't want to help them because we think they're not sufficiently democratic, not sufficiently protective of rights, and therefore no one will help the Ecuador police uh, uh, use these tools even if they're investigating uh, 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 drug trafficking. Uh, so there's, uh, I think it's extraordinarily risky for a company to work with a foreign government on, in that way uh, under this rule, because I believe that is exactly what the State Department wants to regulate. Question in the middle here in the white suit. Thank you, Paul Joyle, NSI. Um, Katie's comment's very, um, very interesting, because it points to the fundamental problem that we face. I mean, the panel, if you look at it, we have Microsoft, arguably could be called the greatest uh, enabler of, of hacking in the world. We have, we have FireEye, we which, call it that. which I'm sure you won't. <laughs> we have, we have uh, FireEye, tremendous business in, in, in exposing and mediating these types of penetrations. Semantic, of course, in the same business. And then, Katie, you're, you're doing the Lord's work by paying people to expose uh, zero day. But the presupposition between it all is that we're operating with non-secure systems, non-trusted systems. And that's the problem. The question, I think the broader, let's say, gets down to the metaphysics of the issue, which is how can we expect to uh, defend ourselves when, when the environment that we operate in is an untrusted environment? Now, when Bigman and others built 
the system for the intelligence community, it's, we have to build a trusted system. So my question is, uh, since, uh, Stuart, you mentioned the OPM hack, when are we get, going to get to the point where at least on the U.S. government side, we build trusted systems that are not open to this type of manipulation uh, that, that is going on? Even the hacking team has just been hacked and lost 500 megabytes of information in their files. So what can we do on building the trusted uh, networks for at least our government? So I, I do want to uh, defend Microsoft, uh, uh, <laughs> for whom I've never worked. Uh, uh, a, 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 that's a, there you go. Uh, uh, but they have taken security seriously since the early aughts. Uh, and have worked very hard, and as we know, every Tuesday, of, of the first Tuesday of every month, we discover that, that they still found more uh, problems. Uh, it, it is not easy to build a trusted system, and the principal reason it's not easy to build a trusted system is we don't really want them, because the controls that would be necessary to make those systems uh, trusted would also make them hard to use. And at and times it's even easier than that. 99% of the time, when a PC is compromised, a patch was already available. It hadn't been installed at the time of compromise. So when you're talking about infecting systems and exploit and attack and malware, you know, this is part of a cultural issue. Why aren't people patching? Why aren't people updating? There are things you can do to protect yourselves and your systems and your networks that, that don't happen. You, know, you, you read about that time and time again. Those are the big hacks that are in the news. It's, uh, you, you, know, you don't necessarily need the skills of an advanced, persistent actor when you leave the, the front door unlocked and all your windows open in the back of the house. And so, uh, you know, the, the state of trusted systems, absolutely, that is a, a desired goal for all of us. And every time we're releasing a new product or putting a new service out there, you know, we are modifying our processes, we're improving our coding, we're refining our operational procedures. But it's it's a system based process and when you take right. so 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 let, let I, me let me let me suggest one one aspect that ties back to this um, we don't have good security today uh, and all the security measures that all the companies up here have implemented are still not preventing things like the OPM hack I uh, uh, and we know we are going to have to innovate because we've got a live adversary that is innovating and, and this is going to be a constant war back and forth as as they come up with new attacks we're going to have to come up with new defenses this is probably the most dangerous aspect of this rule because it basically says well we know how this industry works and we'll just give you exceptions for the things that that provide security and then you'll be fine but of course uh, that does nothing for all the innovation that has to occur in this area it in fact it puts it presumptively under regulation and this is maybe the biggest worry I have about this is that we'll, it will turn innovation, which currently is a kind of hourly, daily event, into something that operates at the speed of the general counsel review. And specifically, the program that I mentioned that, that I started at Microsoft two years ago was designed to provide insight into the next generation of exploitation techniques so that Microsoft could enable its iterative process and build the next generation of defenses across the platform. Without that information ahead of time, Microsoft is just going to be waiting for an attack to take place to learn about those new exploitation techniques. The bad guys have current exploitation techniques that work. They don't need the advancements in exploitation technology to do their job, whereas the defenders absolutely do. Up here in the middle here. Thank you. Uh, Steve Winters, a consultant. Uh, I'm trying to get this into a really simple question, but since we seem to have this image of bad guys, and I think we know who we mean, but at the same time, you have now, as is so well known, uh, state-sponsored hacking attacks. And it's become very clear that some of the groups from the states are not happy with some of the security companies, in particular Kaspersky. Uh, so therefore, I'll direct this to Mr. Baker, since we heard he had some familiarity with NSA. From the, if you were at NSA now, would you be happy with these regulations as 
opposed to their never having appeared? So uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that, that's a great question. Uh, NSA is perceived to be one of the defenders of this rule in the interagency. Uh, um, a, and they are de facto the people who administer what's left of the encryption rules. Uh, uh, my guess is they don't need three quarters, maybe not 90% of what is uh, swept into this rule. That that's uh, the human rights side of the State Department that's pushing for that and perhaps the regulators that, uh, uh, who handle um, uh, license applications. Uh, I think they, you know, they, since they have a defensive role as well as an offensive role, they probably like the, uh, don't like the impact on the cybersecurity industry. They probably do like seeing all the offensive and defensive technologies as they leave. They probably like having some, uh, in basketball, it's, like, it's a hand check. It's not that you're, you're stopping them, but you know what's happening. Uh, so you've got, a, you've got intelligence on everything that's happening in the market. Uh, those things I'm sure they like. Uh, uh, the rest of this, I suspect, is more the State Department than, than NSA. So uh, we, we actually got a question on Twitter, um, and this is a question that I've been meaning to ask this panel as well because, you know, we've talked a lot about ways in which the rules are flawed and all the exceptions that would have to be made, et cetera, et cetera. Well, at this point, we've signed on to the agreement. We're going to have to do something. So what is the solution? What, maybe, we, maybe we can just go down the panel here and start with Katie. Um, what is a workable solution? You can't just have a whole list of exceptions and carve-outs, right? I mean, it would be well, endless. So what's a practical solution here? Well, I think, I mean, the, I am relatively new to this particular bug finding game in regulations. Um, so what, from my understanding, is that since we did agree to the Wassenaar arrangement that we do have to implement it somehow. However, um, it's so clear at this point that there was a fundamental misunderstanding as to what was being regulated. It's along the lines of trying to regulate the first five steps in creating a vaccine, which happened to be the first five steps in creating a biological weapon. They are identical. And so I think at this point, you know, having the right technologists in the room is step one. And I think we've all agreed that, that that's the participation in the technical advisory committees is mandatory for, for those of us who are here and, and will be impacted and understand the implications. And then the possibility of going back to those 41 countries should not be ruled out. We should be able to raise these issues at a global level because it is a global problem and it will affect global defense. So, and then that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, we were talking with the interagencies and, and state was particularly adamant that we weren't gonna go back to Vassenaar and it would be impossible to get the other 40 nations of Vassenaar to say no, um, this, we missed the mark here, let's go back and, and redo it. And um, I don't think the people, at least on this panel, agree with that position. It's like, why can't we go back? and have another conversation with them. And this time, let's get the right people in the room um, and, and talking about it so that, you know, not only the U.S. delegations that go to Vosner, but also the other 40 delegations understand what this industry does, what, what we use these, these tools and these techniques for, and frankly, how you're impacting the, the defense and the critical infrastructure around the world and making the, actually the world more dangerous with this rule. So some people have talked about a, a, a change that would be less focused on the software and technology types, but more focused on who you're selling to. So the you know, oppressive governments, et cetera. Um, is that a workable solution, short of you know, going to renegotiate? I think that still would make us question whether this is the right vehicle. So here's the issue here. Yes, uh, the techies not being able to speak to policymakers is part of the problem. But the bigger issue here is that we're using a framework that's working around munitions and weaponry, and we're talking about tools. And it's right back to your point, Katie, where the first five steps in a vaccine are the same that are used for biological warfare. Source code for a weapon or for the use of a weapon and source code for a legitimate defensive or just a legitimate use tool is completely the same. 
So this isn't just a dual-use munition case, and that's why Wassner's not the right vehicle for this, right? So this is about how do we think about the use of this type of tool? And if we're gonna regulate use, then it doesn't fit in a technology control agreement. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's very, very well put. I'll go back to my earlier statement. Technology controls on everyday technology serve no purpose. You know, when you come back to the question of what is the problem we're trying to solve here, the question presented is how do you prevent the use of surveillance software from being used against those involved in human rights uh, uh, engagements and debates around the world? That is the right question. That is, that is a, a question that we can remain focused on in a narrow and limited way. It may be that there's a solution from a, a, a nation state perspective. It may be that there's an intent-based uh, perspective or a, a sale-based perspective you know, that will require a lot of dialogue and input. Right now, we are thrashing around with a system where we are, we are being asked to look at exceptions and, and uh, terminology that simply doesn't work. If we pivot off the fact that uh, the current definition, uh, if, you, if you read it broadly, as we should, it can even apply to what we call application compatibility uh, capabilities. So sometimes you, if you need your printer to work with your computer, you may have to actually circumvent the security measures on that and enable that with software to, to modify the intended path of the, the file in order to get your computer to print out the document. So we can just stop printing papers for going forward until we can get this fixed. It's, it's, it's a silly example that highlights just how overbroad this is. So definitions will matter. We have to rethink definitions. We have to rethink scope. And narrowly tailored, accepting out from ab initio everyday use technologies. So four, four points on this. One, I, everybody, every agency in the government will admit now that the uh, impact of this is beyond what they expected and that the actual technical implications of the language that, that was chosen at Wassenaar uh, is um, much broader than they expected. To, well, if they know that now, surely that was true of the Wassenaar nations who have fewer bureaucrats uh, devoted to this, uh, which is a basis for going back to Wassenaar and say you, you, you chose the wrong solution here uh, at a minimum. So then the question is, well, but it's already in the law, it's already in Wassenaar, shouldn't we be doing something to implement it? Uh, and I would offer two suggestions. One, uh, I've been providing advice in this area for years to companies, and probably three, four years ago, the uh, 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 Commerce Department and NSA started reaching out to people who were in this business saying, by the way, if there's encryption in your product anywhere, and there always is, uh, you're subject already to export controls, and you need to come in and talk to us. Now, they focused it heavily on this kind of activity, but we are already implementing Wassenaar in a, uh, a relatively effective way, uh, certainly more effective, and I think this is part of what we take back to Wassenaar, than the Italians, uh, who apparently granted a global license for exactly the kind of activity that the Europeans tell us they're trying to uh, regulate. Third, uh, yes, we could do something that is focused on particular governments that we think are engaged in human rights abuses and shouldn't use high-tech tools for that. Um, this entire regulatory construct has been built in part by the State Department so they don't have to say which governments they don't like. Uh, they can just do it in a quiet licensing process after the fact. They really should be forced to say, yeah, there are a few, a few governments we don't want to see using these tools, because that's the problem they're trying to get at, and they're just saving themselves a certain amount of diplomatic pain by regulating everybody and pretending that uh, 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 they can make the decisions later. And then finally, uh, we probably should think about solving this problem uh, much more often with criminal prosecutions. Uh, since this Wassenaar idea came up, the State Department has busted a lot of people using these tools in precisely the ways we don't like, including people who are selling it so that you could s spy on your, uh, on your spouse, and they've made the case under U.S. law already. Uh, since intent is really the critical 
distinction between proper use of these tools and improper use, uh, relying on criminal law, which turns on intent, is probably a much more prudent exercise of government power than, than the export control rules. Well, at this point, we're, we're um, up to our hour and a half mark here. This, uh, this panel has been fantastic and really enlightening for me. And I think our program here at CSIS is going to try to capture a lot of these ideas, the, the, the problems, the flaws with the rule, as well as potential solutions um, in, a, in a brief write-up. And would love to solicit your expertise, folks on the panel, to, to help us with that. Um, but uh, this, is, this has been really terrific, and I wanted to thank everyone for, for, their, uh, for their contribution today, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you.